this morning, we're, we're not going to necessarily have uh, our children's moment, but I want to invite our children who are young in age, as well as our adults who are young in heart, to play a game with me this morning. You guys up for that? Everybody up for a little bit of fun this morning? By a show of hands, how many of our folks have ever heard of the game Simon Says? We're going to play a little Simon Says this morning. So I want you to follow after me. All right, so Simon says, le- raise your left hand. Simon says, raise your right hand. Simon says, put your left hand down. Simon says, put your right hand down. Simon says, put your left hand up. Put your right hand up. If you put your right hand up, you're out. All right, let's start over. Everybody hands down. Up, oh, if you put your hands down, you're out. Simon didn't say. Anybody still in it? I see one hand. All right, let's try this again, for real, though. Let's start over. Simon says, everybody, we're going to start over. We're going to start fresh. Let's try this again. Simon says, touch your elbow. Simon says, touch your other elbow. Simon says, raise your left hand. Simon says, raise your right hand. Do this. Anybody do that? All right. Simon says, put both your hands down. All right. Touch your ear. Touch your other ear. Simon says, touch your nose. Simon says, touch your chin. Touch your nose. All right. Simon says, we're all going to stop. <laughs> so let me ask this question this morning, friends, whether young or old, are we good at following instructions? <laughs> Depends on what we're doing, right? For some of us, when it comes to following instructions like baking, you've got to be very precise. You've got to get temperatures just right. You've got to get measurements just right. You need the right ingredients. You've got to follow the instructions in order that whatever you're baking turns out correctly. When you're grilling, it's a little less uh, rigid. You you know, get it kind of hot, put food on it, make sure it doesn't get burned. That's about the only rules you need to follow, right? Don't eat raw meat unless it's sushi, and then it's a whole different ballgame. But... In life, for many of us, there are going to be rules that come at us and instructions that come at us that we are going to need to follow. I've heard it said that the Bible are the basic instructions to believe before we leave earth, B-I-B-L-E. There are many instructions, many nudges, many rules that we're called to follow. And when we follow them, very often good things happen. So I want to I share a story of what happens when we follow the rules sometimes. It was this past week where I got a, a phone call from one of my best friends. He called me up and he said, hey, listen, I, I need some help. All right, lay it on me. What's going on? Well, he's a part of a Christian networking group at Disney. And they communicate through this online app, similar to like WhatsApp or one of those group apps where they do these things that he hadn't checked it in months, but felt this nudge to follow God's leading to check his app. And in there, there was a message for him. A colleague of his out in California has just gone through uh, divinity school, got their master's of divinity, but in all of this transition was losing uh, their, their housing. So he's now reading this, and he decides to call me. He says, Chris, you're connected. Do you know anybody in this area of California? And I begin racking my mind. I'm like, all right, how far is it from San Diego? I've got connections in San Diego through a church there. I said, it's about two hours from there. I don't know. Let me look. Oh, Fuller Theological Seminary is 30 minutes from there. I had a professor from Fuller. Maybe there's somebody there. And and I said, let me look into it more. All right, great. And I hung up. And I was thinking to myself, I don't have time for this. I'm busy. We're we're doing things. I think at this point we were like getting the meal prepped to bring up to the football team. I'm like, I will look into this later. And maybe I would forget. Maybe I wouldn't. But literally as I hung up with him and I'm having these thoughts run through my mind, a gentleman from our congregation calls and says, hey, I'm going to be there for the work day. Do you need me to bring my pressure washer? I'm like, yes, I do. He's like, do you need anything else? And literally the words out of my mouth were, a connection in California. My son lives there. I said, that's right. What church does your son um, work at? He's like, well, he's at Grace Church. I said, literally, this is the area that I need. 
So after this conversation with one of our members in this church, I followed this instruction, this nudge from God, connected my friend with this church member's son. They connected their other friend who's now going to be meeting with the staff and the pastors at this church to find some help out there uh, this week. And it's amazing what happens when God begins to orchestrate these little bitty things and we follow these nudges, we follow these instructions, we follow these leadings because God is working all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his plans and purposes. That's what Romans teaches us. That's what Paul teaches us in the New Testament, that when we follow God's lead and we follow God's instructions, good things happen. But how do we do when it comes to following rules? How many of us have had those moments where we've had that nudge and God has been like, hey, I need you to follow my lead. And we've been like, I'll get to it tomorrow. How many of us are actually really good at following rules? I found this list this week. I thought it was really funny. These are 20 unspoken rules that society has placed on us that we believe that we're supposed to follow at any given moment of any given day. Can I share a few of these with you? First rule, don't consistently call someone if they have not picked up. Don't call them over and over and over and over and over again. Call and wait for them to call you back. But some of us are impatient, so we call them again, and then we send them a text message, then we're like, what happened? We drive to their house, we knock on the door, we send up smoke signals. Like, we get impatient, but one of the polite rules of society is, don't do that. One of the other polite rules that we're supposed to follow is to say, please and thank you. Another polite rule that we're supposed to follow is that if we borrow somebody's car, what do we do? We fill up the tank. If we lend something out, we expect it back in the same, if not better, condition. We smile. We don't interrupt people when they're talking. We wait until they finish. When someone is speaking directly to us, we give them our attention. We respect others' personal space. We don't pop their bubble. There's two things we should never ask for, an opinion and advice. There's two things we never talk about at the dinner table. Politics and religion. religion. These are rules that we are expected to follow in order to be polite in society. Let me ask, church, one more time, how do we do when it comes to following the rules? Do we do well? Or are we in need of improvement? We're in this teaching series entitled Play to Win. And this entire series is on the topic of discipleship. Discipleship can be boiled down into three things today that I want to look at. It's to walk the walk, it's to fight the fight, and it's to respect the rules. Again, discipleship for us today is walking the walk, fighting the fight, and following the rules. Because as a Christian, if you are in Christ, you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you have believed in your hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then all who call on the name of Jesus will find salvation. So if you are in Christ, you are called to be a disciple. And a disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who walks the walk, who fights the fight, and who respects the rules. So let's unpack that this morning. We want to encourage us to grow as disciples. So the first thing we want to encourage you to do this morning is this. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're called to walk out your Christian faith. So if you've got your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians this morning. 1 Thessalonians in the Pew Bible. It's page 928, and the words will be up on the screen. But I want to invite you to follow along with me. In Thessalonians, you have the Apostle Paul with 
uh, Sylvanus and Timothy writing this letter to the church in Thessalonica, and uh, these Thessalonians, and as he's writing this message, he asks for grace and peace. I ask for the same thing this morning. But then in chapter 4, he says these words. He says, finally then, brothers, and real quick, that Greek word is for the family of faith. So when you see that, Paul is not just talking to the men, as if the, be like, oh, this is not for me. No, this is for the, the whole family. This is for everybody, even though he says brothers. So finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and we urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us how you ought to walk and how you ought to please God, just as you are doing and have been doing, that you would go on to do so more and more. All right, let's pause right there. Paul has been laying out this entire argument of what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he gets to this point and he says that what it looks like to be a disciple is somebody who walks the walk. And for us, we need to hear this as an encouragement, right? We need to go back and walk the walk. Many of us have heard the song, Walk This Way. We need to walk this way towards Jesus. So listen, Paul is saying you've received instructions. So show of hands, how many people are in the room this morning? If you're here, raise your hand. If your hand's not up, you're not paying attention. Because if you've been in the building, you've been here, I've been here with y'all for just a little over three years now. And I know that every week we open this book up, right? And we take time and we we read through the Bible, and we talk about the Bible. We unpack, the word is exegete, we exegete the scriptures so that we can uh, understand God's message for us in our context today. So Paul's encouraging the church then, and he's encouraging the church now, hey, walk out your faith, and as you do so, you do this by following the instructions that you've been given. What are the instructions? Well, how to live and how to please God. Hmm. Take a second and reflect in your own life. How have you been living out your faith? Has the way that you've been living out your faith been pleasing to God? There's no wrong answers. All of us are at different parts in this journey. We talked about last week running the marathon. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. The finish line is far off. And it's so long as we're placing one foot in front of the other, we're walking out our faith. We're making progress and we are growing in the direction of God. So if the encouragement is to walk out our faith, to live the life that pleases God, Paul goes on and he encourages them again. He's like, listen, You've been doing this. Like, isn't that a good encouragement? He didn't come in and go, well, hey, there's a few of you doing really well, but for the most part, the rest of y'all, you haven't even stepped up to the starting line. He's like, no, 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 no. You've been doing this. Okay, let me encourage you that since you've been doing this, continue to do this. Because we understand that we can become complacent, right? What happens when we become complacent? We start to move backwards. We don't make gains. We don't grow forward. We kind of stay right where we're at. And in the midst of complacency, things can feel good. Oh, you know, think about it from our perspective here at church. We get complacent and, oh, the music is, is great. It doesn't ever need to be better. And, and, oh, the preaching is great. It doesn't ever need to get better. But then it just kind of falls off. Oh, the technology is great. But then in a few years, we go from uh, 1080 to 240 to 460. Like, we're, we're on 8K now. And if we just stay complacent right where it's at, things will grow past us. So Paul encourages us to walk out the faith. Walk requires movement. Movement from where we are to where God is. So he's saying you've been doing this. But here, let's go back a little bit because in chapter 3, and I'm not going to read this, but I just want to reference back to chapter 3. Paul tells us that to walk 
without faith is to flee from things in the way. And it sounds counterintuitive, right? That if we're going to walk the walk, we need to run away. Anybody good at running away from things? Right? The joke, the joke is that I'm only running if something's chasing me. And I don't need to be the fastest person there. I just need to be faster than the slowest person if a bear is chasing me. But imagine that the bear of sin is constantly chasing you. And you've got to run the run and flee from evil. So here Paul says that to walk out the faith means to follow God's instructions and to flee from evil. It means to flee from all sin. That in the presence of God most high, who is holy and righteous, sin can't even stand in his presence. And if we are God's children who love God with all of our very being, then we need to allow sin to be the thing that we are fleeing from, not running to. But additionally, we need to run from the rejection of God. And that's not just when we reject God, but that's when others in our life reject God. And I know it's hard because some of us have family members who don't have the same Christian walk that we have, and we have to be very careful that there are sometimes it's easier for them to pull us down into sin than it is for us to lift them up into righteousness. So sometimes we have to flee from those situations that could drag us down because we're called to make gains and walk out our faith. So we run from the rejection of God. But Paul goes on here in chapter 3, and he says, you also have to run from hate, run from apathy, run from harm, run from bad doctrine and bad theology, which means you need to have in your life good doctrine and good theology. You need to run from arrogance and self-centeredness. You need to run from a lack of wisdom and a lack of knowledge. You need to run from gossipers, which is kind of hard, because don't we just love to stand around the water cooler? Don't we just crave controversy sometimes? We turn on things like the news or TMZ or People Magazine or whatever your poison might be, and Paul says, no, 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 run away. We have to run from envy and slander. We have to run from constant friction with friends. And we have to run from discontentment. Paul's point here is this, so hear me. As as the apostle to the Gentiles, those who didn't kind of grow up in the faith, those were new to the faith, as the apostle to those, the one sent to them, he's telling them this message. Hey, if you're going to walk out your faith, walk to God and run away from the things that drag you down. And for you and I this morning, we have to reflect on where we're at in life. Are we walking towards God and running away from the things that drag us down? Or are we holding fast to the sin that is in our life, the sin that's so easily entangles, the author of Hebrews says, are we clinging to those things or are we fleeing from them and running to God? Because as a disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who's pursuing God and pursuing salvation, the call on our life as a disciple is to walk out our faith. I cannot stand before God and give an account of your life. Only you can. Will you stand before God in eternity, before the judgment seat of God, the bema seat, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians? Will you stand before God and be able to say, hey, I walked out the walk as I ran away from the sin? And some of you might be thinking, well, pastor, I'm a little bit older. Well, hey, listen, if you've still got breath, you still have a chance. If you still have life, you still have an opportunity. Your past does not define your present, and it does not uh, um, create within you the inability to have a future. If you are in Christ, you have the hope of tomorrow. But today, make uh, make the promise to yourself to walk away from sin and to run towards God. All right, let's continue on. Second thing, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we're called to fight the good fight for the faith. Now, I don't know about you, I've only ever been in one fight in my entire life. I know I'm a big guy, and it looks like I'm the kind of guy who'd go out and just, just rumble, but no, I was, I was a, 
I was a scared introvert throughout most of my elementary and middle school years. And my first day of high school, I, I had a group of friends, and our group of friends said something to a different group of friends, and it caused some, some drama. And within the very short amount of time after my freshman year of high school started, I was out at the bus loop writing to get picked up and taken home, and I got tapped on the shoulder, and I turned around, and this guy just, boom, sucker punched me. Lip big, bloody, bleeding. He, I'll never forget the look on his face. He was like, expecting to like knock me out and then like jump on me and just start beating me up. And I'm just standing there like, what just happened? And, and he ran away. All I've ever been in until I became a Christian where every day of my Christian walk, I am fighting the good fight of faith. Because it is like that. It's not something that we take lightly. It's something that we put great energy and effort into. In 1 Timothy, we're going to flip a little bit to the right, Pew Bibles, page 934. But in 1 Timothy, Paul, here again, he's continuing to write to uh, this young man, Timothy, who's leading a church, and he's giving him these words of encouragement. And Paul writes to Timothy these words. He says, But as for you... O oh, man of God, again, he's talking to one specific man, but this is applicable to all of us today. But as for you, O oh, man of God, flee from these things, the things we just talked about, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And then Paul tells Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you, Paul says, in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who, is his testimony, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Amen. Paul encourages Timothy, fight the good fight. Some of us are not great when it comes to fighting. Some of us, the only fighting we ever do is with our siblings. And for some of us, that's not the kind of fighting we need to be doing. You know, growing up, uh, my, my family would, as often as they could, would have like family dinners so, like, we would go to my grandparents' house, and there would be aunt and uncles, and they would always be around the dinner table screaming at each other. And I was like, man, they are fighting. And it wasn't until I got older that I realized that they were all deaf, and they were just talking really loud. <laughs> That's not the kind of fighting we're talking about. You know, the fighting for the good... For the good of our faith, Paul says, is to flee from those things we just talked about. This is the fight of the good fight. It means you lace up your running shoes and you run in the opposite direction of the sin that is coming at you. That's the first part, but then there's the running towards. We're called to run towards righteousness. In our own lives, we need to pause this morning, church, and we need to evaluate our life. Are we living in such a way that if God was standing right beside us in this moment, would God be well pleased with the things that we were thinking, with the things that we were saying, with the way that we were living? Because 
The Bible makes it pretty clear that when we confess Christ and we believe in him, we are gifted the presence of the Holy Spirit who takes up residence within our heart, that we become the living temp, uh, the temple, the, the living jar, as, as Paul says, that within us is the Spirit of God who is with us everywhere that we go. And if God is with us everywhere that we go, he sees all that we see, he hears all that we hear, he knows our thoughts, he knows our hearts. Is God well pleased because we are pursuing righteousness, living right in the sight of God, or is God calling us to get back on that path? Because there's always room for improvement. There's always the ability to repent of sin, confess that, know that it's there, turn around and move back towards God. There's always that opportunity to repent and turn around and move towards God. Or are we comfortable and content to live in sin? If we're called to be a disciple, then we flee from those things and we run towards righteousness. We run towards God. We run towards living right, acting godly, and allowing others who act godly to be those who become the guardrails of our life. We run towards deep, abiding faith in the Savior. We run towards love. And we know that there's a, a, a multifaceted nature to love. I'm not talking about the love that I have for tacos, but the kind of love that I have towards my family. The way I love my children is one kind of love. The way I love my wife is another kind of love. The way I love the church is another kind of love. The way I love my Father in heaven is another kind of love. But we run towards love. And Paul says we do so steadfastly. And I know for many of us that's not a word that we use in our, our language today, but it's the idea of continuously. That when you wake up and you live your life and you go to bed and you wake up and you live your life and you go to bed day in and day out, you consistently, consistently run towards God. And lastly, you run towards gentleness. Hey, can I just confess something right now? Um, I'm a news junkie who hates the news because consistently I see that Christians get a bad rap. I don't know if you notice this, but the news doesn't always paint Christians with the best light. Very often we're accused of being things like hypocritical. We are. If you're in here, you, you recognize that a lot of us, yourself included, are, are probably a hypocrite. That's okay. We're hypocrites who are in progress. We are in progress. We are being sanctified and made more into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. It's okay if you're a hypocrite. We're in this together. But we're also accused of being bigotrous, that we are known more for the things we hate than the things we love. Right? If you think of Christians today, very often they're painted as those who hate this or reject that or dislike this. And yes, listen, we're supposed to run away from those things, but we're not supposed to be defined by those things. We're supposed to be defined by the love that we have for God and for others. And in order to be defined like that, we need to have a gentle spirit, not a spirit of confrontation. You can be a gentle giant when you fight the good fight of faith. So let me encourage you, church, to take hold of the eternal life that you've been called to. You have been called to live forever with God in heaven. And if this is the training ground for that, that we are playing to win that prize, then there are things we must do now as we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And these include keeping the commands, Paul says, unstained and free from reproach. So here for Paul, again, to fight the good fight as a disciple means to flee from those things, to run towards these things, to hold fast eternal life, and to respect the rules. So here's my last point this morning, church. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, we're called to respect the rules that God has given to us. Now, I, I know for some of us, especially our young kids, I'm going to pick on you guys right now. I see Lucas up there. He's laughing at me. All right. Don't, don't, you don't need to call him out. I, I'm sorry, Lucas. I called you out. Now everybody's looking at you. 
But very often when I, when I talk with a lot of our young kids, middle school, high school aged, and, and they don't typically go to church, when I ask them, you know, hey, would you ever consider coming to church and being a part of like a youth group or, or, or on like uh, on-campus club? And we start processing through these things. One of the things I always hear at some point is, is I can't be a Christian. Y'all have too many rules to follow. As if the rules that God gives us are meant to prevent us from living out life to the fullest. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We have rules in place in order that we might live life to the fullest. Let me, let me borrow Ella. Come here. Come here. All right. So I want you to stand right here. So they talk about, and I, I, I may have shared this example before, so if you've heard it, just bear with me. But they talk about in um, taking care of cows, that when you put a cow in a pasture, that if you place them here with no fence, they actually will stay right here. They won't move. Because they are afraid because they don't know the boundaries. So they don't want to get lost because they understand that when there's somebody who takes care of them, who feeds them, who loves them, they don't want to wander away from that. But when there are no boundaries, they get afraid. But when there are boundaries, when they know where the fence line is, they know how far they can wander and stay within the fold of God. Or in the case of the cow, the owner. So if Ella was the cow and she knows that this room was the boundary, she knows that she could walk all the way to that wall or she could walk all the way to that wall and she would still be in this room. She would still be safe. But if she didn't see any of that, she would just stand right here and cower in the middle because she doesn't know how far she could go. And for many of us, we need to understand that God gives us rules so that we know how we can experience life to the full, right? All right, you can go sit back down. God has given us some rules. Let's look at a few of them real quick this morning. First rule, we call it the golden rule. Anybody know what the golden rule says? Well, it can be found in Matthew chapter 7, page, nine, uh, page 762 in the Pew Bibles. And Matthew 7 says this. I'll boil it down to this. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also them, for this is the law and the prophets. We'll pause right there. We'll pause right there. However you want to be treated is how you should treat others. This is the golden rule that Jesus has given us. This is one of those rules that God is encouraging us to live by. Why? Because he understands that if we are going to demonstrate his love and be uh, called to be his disciple, then we need to be treating others the way that we desire to be treated. But here's the really interesting thing. How do you hope to be treated? Well, we hope to be treated well. We should have a standard of excellence in the way that we want to be treated. And then whatever that standard is, is the same standard we should be giving towards others. So let's ask ourselves this this morning, church. Do you treat yourself well? And then do you treat others the same way? And if not, today could be the day you start. Don't let your past define you, but live into the future God's calling you to. Second, this is the great commandment. In Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40, it says this. We, we are introduced to the Pharisees again here in Matthew. But when the Pharisees heard that he, Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus responds to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. 
The first rule, the first commandment, the first instruction that that we're looking at here is to treat others the way we want to be treated. And the second is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. That's a, a complex way to say with your entire being. There is no part of your life that should be held back from loving God and then love your neighbor. Some of us think, I don't know my neighbor. Well, maybe today is a good opportunity to go knock on their door and introduce yourself. Or realize that it's not just your physical next door neighbor or the person who lives across the street, but it's the people who are in your circle of influence. In this room, there's a whole lot of neighbors, right? Turn to your left and right. Say, hi, neighbor. (laughs) We're to love one another. Do we love one another? I hope so. I hope so. Do we love our community? Do we know our community? Do we know our waiters and waitresses? Do we know the people who ring us up at the pharmacy? Do we know the person who cuts the meat in the deli? These are our neighbors just as much as the people sitting next to us and those who live next to us. We are a community together. We're called to love one another. Additionally, building on this, in the Old Testament, there are 613 laws that God gives those folks in the Old Testament times to follow. We're going to take the next hour to read through all of them. I'm just kidding. But let me hit the highlight of the top 10. Y- y'all know the top 10 rules. You can find it in Exodus 20, but let me give it to you. The first is you'll have no God but God. The first rule of our life should be that we only worship one God. The second rule is that we have no idols, no money, no car, no house, no child, no spouse, no parent, no thing that comes before God. And it's hard. I love my kids. I do. But they are not the number one priority. Jesus is. They come in a very close third. (laughs) Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, my wife, my children, everything else. Don't misuse the Lord's name. I've shared that I get more offended by hearing the GD bomb or the JC bomb than any F bomb. Because the third rule in the Old Testament is don't misuse God's name. Remember the Sabbath? Take some time to rest. Honor your parents. Hey, listen, kid. Honor your parents. It's one of the rules. Talking to you guys over here too. But listen, young and old, honor your parents. And I, I, I'll never forget, I had a young lady years ago whose mom and dad were out of the picture. They were drug addicts, and it was just a, it was a bad situation. And I got up and I said, you know, our call is to honor your parents. And she got really upset. She's like, how do I honor these people? I said, you know, you're living with your aunt and uncle right now. They're kind of like your parents. You're going to honor them, right? You're going to honor the people who are in a position of authority over you, who care for you, who love you, who take care of you, who feed you, who nurture you, who clothe you. You're going to honor those folks, right? might not be your biological mom and dad, but there is an authority figure in your life that you need to honor and respect. That goes for all of us, young and old. We want to honor other people. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lying, no coveting. These are not there to prevent us from living a full life, but to empower us to live a full life. So church, let's close by saying this. For some of us today, we need to begin to walk the walk. It's never too late. For others of us, we need to recommit ourselves to walking the walk. You're not too far gone. Others of us, we need to continue to fight the good fight while others of us need to start fighting for our faith today. And finally, for all of us, we need to know the rules so that we might obey the rules, so that we can walk the walk, we can fight the fight, and we can respect the rules.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that as your children we have entered into this space to hear that we are called to walk the walk of faith, to walk from wherever we are towards you, Jesus, because you are the author and perfecter of our faith. You are the God who has created us, who sustains us, who loves us, but also has redeemed us and restores us. And because we are made new, Jesus, help us to fight the fight of faith. May we make it a daily priority. Encourage us, Lord. And for those of us who have been fighting well, help us to encourage others well to continue to fight. And still within us the desire to hear your rules, your instructions, your, your, your lead. And still with us the ability to follow. So Jesus, help us to be a disciple. It's in your name we pray. Amen.